Tenants Harbour, Maine. On this land he bought decades ago, mathematician, author and semi-retired professor David Mumford has his refuge in the woods. This is my studio. This is where I work uh, all the time that I'm uh, living up here. I have my library from pure math and applied math and neuroscience and artificial intelligence. It's hard to find enough space. What's nice here, I'm sort of surrounded by the artwork of my family. This, the funny thing is that I'm the uh, mathematician in the family, but almost everyone else seems to be in some form of art. <laughs> David did his PhD thesis at Harvard University on pure maths, algebraic geometry. Algebraic geometry is, uh, is a fascinating field, and I, I think what drew me to it was the way in which same geometric objects could be described by algebra uh, and also uh, by pictures of things that you could actually see. Simply, algebraic geometry is the use of an algebraic equation to describe a line, a curve, or circle, or even a surface. For example, this equation denotes a line, this a circle or curve. Mumford focused on a 19th century concept called the moduli space of curves. All kinds of beautiful curves can be produced by more complicated equations with higher powers in them. So then the problem arose in the middle of the 19th century. How many essentially distinct curves are there? What you do is you say, well, let's just take one of each kind of distinct type of curve. And we put them together as points. And, and this becomes like a map. Uh, this whole thing is th then goes under the big name, the moduli space of curves. And it was tremendously exciting. I worked very hard for a long time trying to take this moduli space, instead of it being an abstract mathematical thing, I wanted to prove some theorems about the nature of this space. You, you, you have the strong feeling as a mathematician, you are somehow reading in, a, in this book uh, of absolute mathematical truths that's been there forever, but no one before you has been able to read this book. And so the, the excitement of it is, to try to get a little deeper and find out some, some facts. And you, all you have are your bare hands. David won the coveted maths prize, the Fields Medal, in 1974. Hong Kong-born Dr. Tai Sing Lee is a computer science professor at Carnegie Mellon University. Lee was a graduate student of David Mumford during David's over three decades teaching at Harvard. So he could be called like one of the foundation fathers of the modern algebraic ge geometry. So what he has done is equivalent to a paradigm shift. He made the whole field more rigorous. Basically, he is able to bring his educated eye to see, see simplicity, to get at the essence of things from very complicated phenomena, and bring that kind of educated eye to the field of computer vision and biological visions. In the 1980s, David Mumford switched from pure maths to applied maths, specifically in computer and biological visions. Uh, I actually uh, built myself a, a computer when I was in high school uh, with 100 uh, relays. And it worked for about half an hour, and then it had a huge spark came and it burned up. I said, I had better stick to paper and pencil. In the mid-80s, uh, went back to this. What happened was quite a lot of fun. I went to a, a meeting in this incredibly beautiful place in, in Italy. My friend Giant Shah um, and I, we were sipping scotch on the balcony of this hotel room looking over the Mediterranean and we said, well, I wonder what's happening in artificial intelligence. It's very exciting. You suddenly get seized by a certain excitement that you're going to try something new. And so, so we did. Oh, wow. That's a nice one. That's a good one. Yeah. Uh, and the big surprise when I began studying computer vision was that it was hard. It seems almost trivial that you look out at the world, you see the objects in front of you. Why can't a computer do that? 
So the first thing David tackled was how computers can be programmed to segment images. You take a picture of these rocks and you say to yourself, what are the objects present in that scene? You have uh, the seaweed and the rocks and the water behind. Now, if you were to try to segment this, you'll find the computer completely confused. How many rocks should he consider as separate objects? What it should realize is that these rocks is really just one texture. And it really should be grouped into a, a single part of the image. David proposed using variational calculus. And we can set up some functional whose minima is going to give us these segmentations. Except uh, that unfortunately it doesn't work very well. <laughs> uh, images are more complicated. Take the human face. It can be distorted by illumination and varying proportions. So you have to do some sort of a warping of the face. So we created a probabilistic model uh, of the face. Incorporating all these ways in which one template of a face could be made to reproduce an arbitrary picture of a face. This was a really new problem in statistical pattern recognition. Most recently, of course, people would like to recognize terrorists when they pass through customs and um, immigration control. So uh, there are co many companies now doing this, uh, this sort of thing. Then David realized imagery was even more complicated. For example, how could a computer detect tanks or false alarms in a forest? The forest is cluttered. Scenes of the world are cluttered. They have tiny things present and big things present. And sometimes the tiny thing is the important thing. And the big thing is fairly irrelevant. You have to take into account that images have what we call uh, a multi-scale nature and synthesize uh, in, a, in, in your model uh, this complicated, uh, cluttered structure. Finding the right probability models to really describe patterns and images is still being tackled by David and his graduate students at Brown University, where he has been professor of applied mathematics since leaving Harvard in the mid-1990s trying to match faces uh, to see whether we can learn computer to distinguish, for example, between different uh, races, uh, Caucasian, Asian, African. It is actually very useful stuff for um, fields like um, medical imaging, uh, for creating pre-diagnostic software to help doctors to, um, uh, to see whether a patient is sick or not. One of the goals, I think, in medicine today is to develop on the computer universal models of the human body, three-dimensional, uh, with all the, the uh, structures within the body. It connected to my older ideas about the moduli space in pure math, where we were producing this map of all of the objects of a certain kind that could exist. But for this medical atlas... This map should have points in it which describe every, the shape of every single heart that uh, is possible in a human being, or every single brain. David believes some imaging problems can be resolved imminently. Medical imaging is one which is really right around the corner. Computers will be able to drive cars without the intervention of human beings. But it's hard to foresee exactly when a computer will be able to attain human skills in looking at an image of the world and being able to name the objects present in it. Rich in imagery is the Tenants Harbour home of David Mumford. Now 69, he was born in Sussex, England of an English father and American mother. He came to the US at age three and attended Exeter and Harvard. His first wife, Erica, an award-winning poet, died of breast cancer. Second wife, Jennifer, is a professional artist. You um, take this heat gun. It will melt the wax so that it moves around a great deal, and then you can draw into it. Yeah. So they were. Well, we're still trying to figure out which spore print to use here. I mean, you know what I really love about 
your stuff. It starts with uh, it starts with something the actual very, pattern, it but then you, you bring out these abstract shapes in it. So, so this is Jen's son Andrew, who lives on Martha's Vineyard. Uh, he does these just gems of pictures of the vineyard and. and uh, my son is, is more... He's, a, he's uh, an adventurer, and he likes to he's travel. He's an adventurer, that's very and, true. And uh, he likes to put himself on the edge of things. When he was 20... Very much like his father. This one is, is, is Baghdad. He spent about a year after the American invasion doing uh, watercolors and drawings. My own sister is an artist. My second son is a photographer. Greatly artistic family, but you yeah. are colorblind. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, many many paintings. I, I can see the yellow blue, but the red green is. And you relate France <laughs> with art. Can you tell us something about that? Yeah, well, I, I, form is very exciting to me, and and shapes. So Jennifer, do you see art in maths? Well, to tell you the truth, I think that the process of creativity is somewhat the same. I mean, you hope that you'll be able to think outside the box and create things. But to tell you the truth, I don't have a clue. <laughs> I don't have any idea what David does. I mean, he's explained it, but I just, uh, it's, it's a whole different world. So, so Hannah, how do you like math? Some of my favorite subjects. Really? Yeah. Oh gosh, there's so many people who I, I meet and they say, oh, I hated math, and here I am a mathematician. It's wonderful to hear that. They should make it um, uh, seem more uh, interesting and concrete for people in your position. Like one of David's own pet projects at Brown University. A really challenging experience was to try to devise a course which would appeal to undergraduates who otherwise are going into history, economics, literature, uh, some of the beauties of, of mathematics. David Mumford plans to retire next year. He hopes to visit often his huge and scattered family. That's definitely going to be one of the great advantages of being retired. The seasoned sailor also plans to take a long boat trip to the Bahamas. You feel a certain sense of freedom, which for me is, there's no other way to get it. 